is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering The Magicians, Season 2, Episode 3, Divine Elimination. In this episode, I'm really hoping that this is a fake out and two really interesting female characters aren't both dead because I will be very upset about it. I will. Also, I would like to say that I told you so. Reynard is way, way more scary than the Beast, in my opinion. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Uh, so, guys... A lot happens this episode. So, so very, very much. Um, It's kind of hard to know where to start in some ways because it's, I, I tend to focus on things that feel like the major event of the episode. And it, like, one could very easily point to the beast is gone. It seems. You don't really, like, his, it, it feels like. I'm going to say it. I don't think really the beast is gone. Just a bunch of moths came out and his body went down. But it feels kind of like maybe those moths are responsible for like the badness. And maybe those moths could just go and chat somebody else up. So I'm not convinced. And I think that's part of why it's not like the one that my brain immediately points to as here's what happened this episode. The What's going on with the beast I'm just less interested in than what's going on with Renard. Like, I just am, you know? And I... Ugh, I don't... Okay, so first of all, I'm just way, way ahead of myself because I need to thank Nicole for this episode. Nicole, every time that you were the one that has commissioned an episode, you've commissioned one that I'm really interested in. And so then I forget to thank you right away the way that I normally do. So I'm sorry, but also thank you for commissioning some of my favorite episodes so far. Um, Yeah. So, okay, let's start, let's back this up and start at the very beginning of this episode. First of all, it's called divine elimination, which is just so stupid, but very funny because not knowing what that actually is about, when you're watching the episode, of course, it just sounds like, oh, a god's being killed. Sweet. And instead, it's just that a god took a really horrible shit, which is so awful. I hate it so much. That joke goes on such a long time. Oh, my God. Okay. But I would like to high five Elliot forever for making the joke that I made last episode in which I said that the Reinhardt Ultra or whatever it is sounds like a very bad beer brand. I'm very happy that he thinks this as well. I feel like this really cements our friendship and I would like to take credit from for this part of the script uh, even though it was already written. So just as long as we can all agree on that. Um, but everybody has come back to uh, the castle and they're all talking to him about, you know, what they've been doing. And he is kind of feeling like, I don't even want to say he's feeling left out because I think in some ways he's kind of joking about it. But there's like a flicker of like, wow, you all have really been up to some shit because he knows about the back tattoos and the creatures and the whole thing is... uh you know, something that not only was he not there for, but he literally can't be there because he was, you know, he he's bound to Fillory now. So there is no way for him to participate in some things. And I think that's really what's getting to him more than anything. Isn't that he wasn't there, but that he would like, he wouldn't have had a choice anyway, even if he had known what was going to happen. It's not, not like he could have tagged along. And um, he's leading them all into the throne room. And 
we know as viewers that there is a curse somewhere in this room. I immediately assumed that the curse was going to be on the thrones when this was told to us as viewers, because that just makes sense. Like, what's the what's the ultimate symbol of power? One could say the crown, but we, they already got the crowns. So if it hadn't been that they'd already gotten those, that's what I probably would have assumed. But instead, we very quickly see that it's actually the thrones themselves. And he's really excited to show all of them how he has fixed this room up, this throne room, which granted does look dope as hell. I really would love to know how they light and like fuel the braziers that are literally inside marble columns. But that's a question for another day. Um, and when he shows everybody, it's like, there's a very purposeful lingering of the camera on the goblets that are on each of the seats. Um, so there's a throne and a pillow and a goblet on each one. And I kind of like, honestly, despite the camera focusing on that, it did not even occur to me that it was the goblet that had been the problem. It drove me bonkers that they go ahead and sit on the throne without even thinking about it and assume it's the cup. Like, I just, guys, I, it made me a little crazy. Am I the only one? I know y'all probably suspected too, right? Those of you watching, like, tell me the truth. Tell me the truth. You thought that too. And the writers are just making them a little bit lazy because they needed everybody to be in on this whole thing, right? Um, and Elliot is showing these off and really happy about how he's cleaned up this room. And I don't know that they appropriately respond because they don't really, I mean, they've been through a lot. Granted, they're a little distracted, but also they didn't see the room before. <laughs> so they don't realize what it looked and smelled like. Um, and I would also like to take a sidebar to just give a grateful happy, like longing look at Elliot's suit that he's wearing, which is this gorgeous silver damask. I, it might even be like, not just damask, because that's usually just silk. It almost looks like it might be some sort of burnout velvet. It is gorgeous. And I love it. And it's tailored and fits so perfectly. And I just love it so much. Um, Hugabug in the chat says, I in no way even considered it being anything other than the throne. See, thank you. This is what I'm saying. That was a hundred percent what I assumed. So the fact that it doesn't seem to have occurred to the characters and they all just go ahead and fucking sit on them makes me really irritated, but whatever, because it winds up being sort of funny in a way later on. Um, so yeah, he's wearing this incredible suit and as he's like telling all of them that they need to enjoy themselves a little bit, Penny sort of interrupts and is just like, guys, we have a lot to think about. And he's and Elliot sort of interrupts and is like, listen, you can take five minutes to sit down and have a glass of wine and sit on a fucking throne. Like, come on. So he sits down and the moment that he does, his eyes fly open and he stares at Margot. And he sees her in his mind. It's very clear because the moment the camera's back on her again, she doesn't have this expression on her face. It's, it's just, it's obviously, it's obviously the throne. It's obviously when he sat down, but she says, you're such a stupid, stupid man. I'm going to kill you in your sleep. And then he sees Ellie or um, Quentin whispering in Alice's ear and the two of them looking at him and sort of like, clearly as he would see it colluding um and they all immediately know that something is wrong like they can tell that his facial expression has changed and i appreciate this a lot at least that even if they make the characters all too fucking stupid to know the most obvious shit about the thrones being the ones and also can i just point out too i i, I can't understand how Quentin was warned about this and fucking never even thought to say anything. This is treated in the script like, I don't even know. I guess like, oh, I forgot until things started happening 
that Julia had warned me about this. Really? You just forgot that the beast, Mothman, the one y'all are fighting, capitals, enemy, placed a curse on the room you were about to walk. You just forgot until after? Quentin, fucking, what are you good for? Seriously, though. Like, and, and in some ways, I could say maybe it wouldn't matter if he had warned them because maybe they wouldn't have thought the thrones were the thing because evidently the writers decided to make them stupid right now. So maybe they would have sat down on them anyway. But I like to think that if they had gone in there with that warning, they could have done some sort of scanning spell that would have been able to detect there was something going on with them. So anyway, the whole way this goes down really doesn't make any sense and sits very wrong to me and totally depends on Quentin not saying anything and nobody, including Alice, the smartest person in the fucking school, not even thinking that it was the Thrones, while you and I, our regular old viewers at home, all assume that without question. But fine. So he, like... Margot is the one who can see that they are, that Elliot is acting weird. And Alice says something about talking strategy. Um, and Quentin says, well, we already talked strategy. We need to get moving. And Elliot says, you've been planning without me. And Quentin's like, yeah, when we were on earth, what did you think we were doing? And Elliot gives this really, weird, uncomfortable sort of laugh. Honestly, his acting right here is pretty top notch. And everybody looks at him in this way as he's laughing because it's not his normal laugh at all. And Quentin says, Elliot, we're not trying to exclude you. You just weren't there. And Elliot stands up very suddenly. No, I wasn't. Was I? Don't think I don't see how this works. You disappear. You come back. Matching tattoos, and now you're three against one. And I know exactly what you're planning. And Margot steps in and says, sweetie, you sound sort of insane. And he says, do I? Because I promise I will not go down easily. Usurpers. And then turns around again and says, usurpers. Whichever way you're supposed to pronounce it. And like kind of scuttles out of the room the way he holds his whole body as he scuttles out of this room is the most funny thing to me he's in like a kind of a crouch like he's trying almost like he's tr on the defensive in case one of them like lunges at him but his arms are sort of held akimbo as if he's like not really sure what to do with them and he looks like extra weak and just sort of like flailing it is i just fucking could not stop laughing because of course to me it's obvious what happened you know he's that's the curse is that there's this deep paranoia and sort of like bloodlust happening um and i really like this because it's one of the it's like a bit of a cliche but it is a cliche for a reason that when you're in power you begin to think that everybody is out to get you because you are naturally actually going to be a target. So that paranoia is unfortunately steeped in some truth a lot of the time. And you have to figure out as a leader, how you want to manage that. It's like, are, do you let it get the best of you and dictate everything you do? That's pretty much what you have to decide. And so this sort of thing where it's everybody turned against one another is really, really something. And I love how this goes down because later on, obviously, I don't like the way this goes down right away after he runs out of the room because Alice and Elliot both decide that they're or Alice and Quentin, I keep calling him Elliot, decide that they're both going to sit on the thrones. Um, But... I really enjoy the like way that the show plays all of them being bloodthirsty against one another as a comedy bit rather than making it like very dramatic with a capital D. 
I feel like some shows really would have played this as being sort of like, oh my God, who's going to wind up dead? When as a viewer, I'm not really worried about that. I assume if anybody does wind up dead, we'll find a way to bring them back, which is pretty much exactly what winds up happening. But we know these characters well enough that having them all either acting wildly out of character or in the case of Margot, acting essentially exactly like herself, except for the fact that she's brewing a poison, is kind of amazing to watch. I don't think this joke would work in season one the way that it does in season two once we've gotten to know everybody better. Um, so Alice, of course, did anybody notice that he started acting strangely once he took a drink from the goblet and then sits down and immediately gets this weird expression on her face. Um, and slowly Penny remains the only person who has not sat down and knows what is happening and has to go to Elliot's wife for help because he realizes that like, this is a spell that it seems can only end in their deaths. That's literally the only way that this is going to be broken. And I really enjoy him teaming up with Elliot's wife. And I, I don't even remember her name at this point. Again, I feel so bad because I know that you guys have told me this before already. But I am so glad that the show has figured out something to do with her. Like, it's just it would have been really easy for her to not matter. It could have been a complete throw away that he got married. And every time that we were reminded of it, you'd be like, Oh yeah. What's up with her anyway? But instead it, it, she is really involved with everything and intelligent and has like good understanding of, you know, not only what's going on with this group, but she's like been around and seen what has been happening. So, she has like past information that's useful as well. And I just really appreciate this, this whole turn of events and shout out to Alice going up to Penny and telling him that she's going to kill Quentin too. And skipping away practically. It is so funny. Like I love it so much. Um, Hugabug says Fen. Oh, thank you. I never remember. That's why I don't remember, though, because it's not rem a memorable name. She's not in the books, and I love her as an addition. Oh, okay. Yeah. So good on you, show. Um, and we have the amazing scene where Penny tries to go and talk to Margot about what's going on. And she says, I have a plan. It's fine. You're going to help me pick these. And he says, what is this, an antidote? And she says, exactly, for the poison. And he says, for what? And she says, for the poison, I have to drink it first or I won't get Elliot to take it. And he realizes that she is enchanted also, but just doesn't actually act the way that the others act when she is paranoid. And this is what I love about knowing who these characters are. Margot paranoid just looks like overconfident Margot. Margot paranoid is not even really paranoid. She's just a woman with a to-do list. Like she's just got her plan that she seems to have no doubt whatsoever she's going to be able to execute, pun intended, without any issue. There's no question in her mind. And I love that about her. And I just completely am like here for this, this whole side of her getting to really play. Because I don't feel like any of us doubt that this side of Margot is there somewhere ready to come out if necessary. And sure, it was this paranoia spell that finally allowed her to like extend her claws. But I like getting to see it in a context like this, where it's sort of a joke rather than being played as like, you know, do you get what I'm saying? So anyway, um, and she says, by the way, you were wrong about the thrones being cursed. I sat on mine and I'm totally fine. And it's so great. 
Um, this will be over soon. I'll deal with Elliot and Alice and Q. You're welcome. Of course, doesn't mention the fact that she's going to almost definitely kill Penny too, but she winds up not doing that, even though all the others seem intent on killing Penny, which I guess is supposed to be the like one loophole that keeps her, that keeps them being able to, uh, execute the plan that Penny has later on for killing and then bringing them all back. Um, so that's the whole cold open. Like that shit's like, you know, 15 minutes long. Um, and then we get to the main episode and we start off with Marina and Julia getting together. And I am really, really bummed guys. I am deeply hopeful that the next episode is going to begin and I'm going to find out that something could be done to save Marina. I don't really feel that's going to happen, but I want it to be true. So, so, so much. Um, Huggabug says, well, he's not a king of fillery, so they aren't compelled to kill Penny. No, but both Alice and, uh, Quentin look at Penny and agree mutually that he needs to go. So I assumed that 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 him just being involved with them that that he was like wrapped in their paranoia but maybe not um so what they are planning to do and this is so frustrating because the beast keeps on kind of just stepping in and doing whatever he wants and not telling julia about this um but what they plan to do is have marina summon reynard while uh Julia waits in the wings with her special knife and, you know, we have the beast like holding him hostage, basically, or holding him in place. Um, and so she says he knows a spell to freeze a god. Uh, you can't find that at your local safe house. Um, and Marina is telling her all of this, like, this whole plan that Julia thinks is so foolproof is going to end with the beast turning on either one of them, potentially. And Julia says, we have an agreement, word of bond. And Marina admits that's something that's hard to break in the magical world. But guess what? So is holding and freezing a god in place. So if anybody is capable of going back on their word, then it's going to be this guy. So maybe don't be so sure. This whole thing kicks off and Marina is not convincing. She is just so cynical. The whole like summoning is played off as, as a joke really to her. Like she just isn't invested at all. And she's in the middle of, of finally really committing once uh, Julia comes at her and is like, you need to believe this. You need to act like you believe this or else he is not going to come. He will sense that you are full of shit and he is not going to bother. He wants people who are like, genuinely devoted and, and invested. That's the fun for him. So Marina starts to do better. And as wind picks up and it becomes pretty clear that this spell is actually going to work, the beast lays a hand on Julia and she turns around and they are in the middle of a park. And she's like, where the fuck are we? What are you doing? And he says, we can't go back. Reynard has, Reynard has scented you before. And if he smells you again, he won't show. If you want him, you might have to risk losing your bait. And she, of course, is just like, I can't believe that you didn't tell me this. To which he's like, you wouldn't have agreed if I had told you this. So I, I, this is how it has to work. But it's not like. You know, you're acting like there was some sort of other option that I could have gone with, if not this. And 
genuinely there isn't. You needed somebody who was convincing and alone. That's what you needed. And he, even if we were like nearby, would have been able to tell. I don't think that the beast needed to take her quite so far away. He could have taken her two rooms down, probably. But nevertheless, Marina finishes her spell, looks around after feeling that something really did work, and sees that not only is Reynard not here, but Julia is also gone. And she is very irritated about the fact that she has just been, like, left alone. And snaps out all of the candles and heads home. She has a lot of wards on her place, as we find out later. Um, and unfortunately, they work against her here. Because Julia comes back to the warehouse. She sees that this girl is gone. Figures that Reynard didn't show up. And the beast is like, well, you know, we don't know that he didn't come. Maybe he just wanted to kill her at home. He says, are you absolutely sure it didn't work? I might follow her um, rather than kill her on the spot, which is a weird thing because there's not, as far as I can tell, a pattern that shows that he is interested in stalking people home. Every place that there has been a body turning up, I mean, he killed one woman right in her office and Marina like ran into her. Other people he killed on the spot at their rituals. So I'm not really understanding how this like, I'm not even understanding plot wise for the writers why they needed there to be a like ch a change of location except maybe to draw things out and make like the um, them getting at her to help her a little bit more difficult, I guess. But anyway, when Julia looks at him after he says that and she's like, oh my God, you fucking knew this was going to happen. And he says, that's why I took you out. And if we are right, then all we need to do is go to her apartment um, again, with Julia, just assuming that because the beast has agreed to help her, that also means that he has agreed to do what she says, which are not the same things at all. He has agreed to a particular task, which is to help her kill a god. And he is going to accomplish that because she hasn't laid down specific parameters of what he is and isn't allowed to do in what he considers the most expeditious way. So guess what? That means doing exactly what the fuck he feels like. So we go to Marina's house. She is organizing all of her wards and, you know, lighting the candle and setting everything up in her apartment. It's really cool, honestly, to see like the webbing of the spell click into place after she lights the candle. But then she turns and Reynard is standing there and says, you know, you just locked me in here with you. And as he's saying this, we see Julia and the beast outside of her apartment and her words are strong enough that even the beast is kind of like, this is going to be a little bit tricky, actually. Uh, I can do it, but it's definitely going to take time. And we know, meanwhile, that she is inside, like fucking in the middle of being tortured while they are out there doing this. And it is pretty agonizing. I'm not going to go into every little thing, but here are the highlights. One, he turns her cat inside out. Guys, this is the worst thing in the entire world. I hate it so much. I hate it so much. I hate it so much. Y'all know. I mean, most people that are not total monsters have a particular reaction to the abuse of animals. And this is not only, uh, you know, like his back is to her. So you just hear the crunching and the cat like yowl. But 
when he puts this like mangled bloody heap on her lap, it's still moving around. And he says something about, oh, I think she's still alive. That's funny. And it's like the way he says it, he genuinely seems to think that's funny. Like it, it the way that line is delivered, you know, he is aware he's torturing her. Like he knows this upsets her. But for him, it is a joke. It's not like it's just less than does not bother him. It is entertaining to do this. And I find this to be like, you know, when I was a kid and you were taught in school um, about various trickster gods that are in all kinds of different mythologies. There's Native Americans, there are Greek and, and Norse and there's all different kinds. There was always a sort of veneer over the trickster god that made them child friendly so that it was like, oh, they would play pranks. Basically, they would do things to irritate people or to really like just like make them humiliated kind of thing. But then as I got older and I started to do my own reading on trickster gods that were, of course, my favorite, because I am always a sucker for somebody who makes me laugh. I realized that what I thought was not really the thing. These weren't Fred and George Weasley gods. These were vicious, bloody, just malicious gods that did that played shitty, terrible tricks for fun because they have a warped sense of what that is. Um, you know, it, it's really difficult to kind of come to terms with that when you have always thought of yourself as a fan of certain gods and, and realizing that you've been kind of lied to regarding what they are and who they are. And this god is right on target in terms of the type of shit that he is getting up to. And it's really, really hard to watch. So after turning her fucking cat inside out, she has managed to get her hands free, but he knows it. And when she grabs her hands out from behind her and holds them up to try and cast, he grabs one of them and says, uh, 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 no magic and bites her fingers off. <sighs> Y'all, if you could have seen my face in that moment, I almost hit the ceiling. It just was so sudden. It was done in such a playful kind of way. Like the actor playing Reynard is doing a way better job of being Reynard than he was at being Richard. I think Richard just felt sinister to me even when he was supposed to be like on our side i just didn't like him he just had a bad vibe so i feel i don't know if that was like intentional or if i was supposed to like him more than i did but i felt like he was conning her the entire time and it turns out he was not actively like deceiving Julia, but he was wrong about everything. And him as Reynard is so much more appropriate. There is something to this guy's eyes that feels very lacking to me. There's something about the way that he looks at people that feels calculating. And it suits a character like this way, way better than it suited Richard, who was supposed to be a sort of an honest, like, helpful soul. And, yeah, he bites her fingers off in this way, like you would to a little kid that you're like, you know how like babies have cute little chiclet fingers, um, or good and plenties. Um, he sort of grabs her hand and puts it in his mouth like, oh, 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 and then literally chomps them off. And then he like spits them into his hand. And begins to sort of nibble on them like they're carrot sticks or something. Oh my god, you guys. It's so horrifying. And she just has to watch him do it. Oh, Jesse says the way he chews her fingers like he's eating Cheetos is horrifying. 
that's what it is, Jesse. It's Cheetos. Oh, God. I'm never going to be able to eat Cheetos again. That's probably for the best, to be honest. They're trash, but I love them so much. Um, so, yeah, he has moved on to because he ties her down again. And, you know, she keeps on. She puts on a brave face. Honestly, she's able to keep up that face for far longer than I would have been able to at this point. And it's clear that he intends to rape her, but it's interesting to me again, that the show is, it feels like she is an exception to him. Did he eat anybody else's fingers? Did he at all wait until he was like, did uh, did he torture anybody else before killing them? Did he toy with anybody else before killing them? I don't feel like we've seen any evidence that he has. It looks like he just shows up and rips people's hearts out right away. So I want to know exactly what it is about Marina that caused him to take his time the way that he did. If it was her attitude toward him and the, the fact that she wasn't like, you know, again, it's just the the fact that he followed her home rather than killing her on the spot. There is a lot about the way this went down that feels like it doesn't match his M.O. with literally anybody else. So I don't totally understand why they did it this way or why I am supposed to believe he would do this with Marina and nobody, nobody else. Like, other than because the plot needs there to be time to save her. And it kind of annoys me that that's the best that it seems like they can do. I don't know. Um, Hugabug says she's also the only person who cast alone instead of with a group, which intrigues him because it is an anomaly. Okay. That's true. I forgot that he said that. So that makes me feel better. Cause it just was weird. Like, you know, um, and I still want to know exactly the circumstances of him showing up and killing that woman that she was going to be allied with, because it seems like they keep assuming he's going for people who are, you know, performing this certain ritual. But as far as we know, and as far as it looked like in her office, this woman was not in the middle of performing the ritual and he still showed up at her place and killed her at work with no, you know, compunction so I just maybe there is just not really a pattern to what he's doing but it felt like they were trying to establish a pattern in the show in order to give them a method of calling him up um so that's part of why I'm a little bit like I don't know I feel like he's a little all over the place um I'm going to backtrack a little bit and we'll talk about what's going on with all of the kings and queens first of all there is a pretty wild like projection of bright light on one wall that looks like uh, veins or I think it's supposed to be a tree, but it really looks like veins. Maybe it's supposed to be like a map of the river or something. Um, and when the camera is pulled back and we have that and the like huge pillars with the braziers lit inside and everything it is a pretty impressive looking set like i think that they did a lovely job with this to be honest and everybody is of course uh like in they are all up against one another and they're all at different sides of the room while penny and fen keep them all where they are by using the crossbow and he is planning on killing all of them by using a drug so a drug overdose and then bringing them back so that the curse will reset itself because he killed them technically even though they did not actually die um and i love when he holds up the syringe because it turns out to be something else but elliot sees it and says heroin I always suspected this was how I'd go. I'm like, oh, Elliot, you need to change your habits, sweetheart. I love you. Don't do this to yourself. But yeah, it turns out to be potassium chloride, which will shut down the heart. Adrenaline will kickstart it. Um, you die, curse ends. I revive you. And it's an interesting thing because Quentin says 
what if any part of that plan doesn't work? And he doesn't say it's not a curse. And I find that pretty intriguing that I don't know if it's supposed to be that they're just sort of humoring him because he's the one that's got the crossbow. And they're just like, yeah, 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 sure. Uh, It's definitely a curse, whatever you say, buddy. And they plan to just like fuck him up. Um, And poor Penny, he shoots a crossbow bolt. And then it turns out that he can't pick up the crossbow because his hands are a little numb due to these anti-curse bracelets that he's wearing. And so trying to pick it up again gives them the opportunity to start some shit with one another. Meanwhile, behind his back, without anybody noticing, Margot grabs one of the needles and does Quentin right in the neck. And she looks so excited the way that she like turns and stares at them all it is so funny to me i wish that when she had like run over to the table that she just grabbed all of them because apparently she just grabs the one and does quentin and then they all have to like race each other back to the table to get the rest i don't feel i feel like margot would have grabbed all of them but it makes it more entertaining if everybody's got one um in the end of course She does win, so it doesn't matter. But it is a... The whole, like, expression on her face, I love her so much. She's got these, like, gold ankle boots, and she's wearing this weird sort of, like, romper jumpsuit sort of outfit that is... Her outfits are so great always, but also... I know are going to be if we ever like watch this show 10 or 15 years from now, her outfits are always going to be the ones that we point at and go, Oh my God, I forgot about that. People loved jumpsuits. It was such a thing. Oh, look at how weird that looks. Like 100% Margot is going to be the, the person who dates the show the most. Um, so yeah, she says, She has her, you know, needle and she's standing there holding it up like she's going to stab Penny and says, what's best in life, Penny? And he says, what? And she says, what's best in life? And he says, "I, I don't know. And she says... To crush your enemies, see them driven before before you and hear the lamentations of their women. And I'm pretty sure that's a quote from somebody. Is that Genghis Khan or fucking Napoleon? (laughs) Um, But yeah, she's holding the thing up and like looks like she's going to come at them. But then she sees her hand turning towards herself, seems totally mystified, and plunges the needle into her own chest. And Penny says, that's one thorough fucking curse. To which Fence says, is it wrong to say that I found her death extremely satisfying? Which honestly, Fen, I can't be mad at you for that. I like both of you in different ways and I can understand why Margot would be a little bit much and be difficult for you. That's fine. Um, and we fast forward to everybody sort of waking up and having like a fucking needle projecting from their chests. Everybody else is kind of back already, but Quentin is the last and they have to like pull the needle out. Oh guys, this is one of those things that like, I don't know who figured out that we could do this, that we could like bring back a stopped heart with adrenaline with a needle directly into the fucking heart muscle. Like I, what the experiments must have looked like to reach these conclusions does not. um, There is something about modern medicine and the fact that, It is a miracle and we have so many amazing advancements, but also knowing that a great deal of it came at the expense and suffering of like innocent people or the creepy experimentations of mostly men a lot of the time who did not have a lot of empathy 
And it is hard to celebrate certain things for me. And this is one of those things that I'm just like, what, what, what did, what did they do? How did they, did they like smother people? And then just like, uh, anyway. Um, but yeah, it seems as if this curse is actually over. And Alice, for her part, has that bracelet on that is really starting to burn. You can see that there's a welt on her arm, which I don't know how many of you have ever had like a pretty intense burn on your body, but it is super painful. And the fact that Alice is bearing this as well as she is, is kind of miraculous because that's like, there is almost no pain that I can think of worse than a burn. It's so fucking excruciating. Um, so they all talk about how they're going to do this um, because they know that Alice needs to execute this spell. She's the only one that's going to be able to manage it. And how are they going to get the beast where they need to go? To which Penny is just like, listen, if you guys don't need me for the spell, I can be the one that goes and grabs him and comes back with him. Um, and... When they ask him, like, how are you going to get him if your spell hands aren't working very well? He kind of insists that all he needs to do is touch him so it should be fine, which does turn out to be true. But the fact that his bracelets have stopped working or aren't, they stop working when he takes them off, but they are degrading this quickly. It's a problem. So what follows, guys? is one of the more frustrating things ever on television in the entire world. So uh, I hate even talking about this. It's so it makes me so crazy. Fucking Reynard is about to bite off Marina's toes. And all of a sudden he freezes in place and Marina realizes that she has been saved and the look on her face when she realizes and jumps up is so like her acting is so good. You guys, I feel like she's just like, if she's dead, they have just wasted such a great potential for the show to turn a corner and do something really interesting. Ugh, but she spits in his face, which I fucking love. I wish she would knee him in the balls, but I understand feeling like that's not safe. Um, they are in guys. I want to be mad at our crew who comes and swoops in and takes the beast away after Julia, like just really asked for Quentin to wait. I want to be mad at them to a degree. I am. Because I do feel that Reynard is more of a threat. I don't... Okay, so all of, all of magic goes away if the beast wins. I'm still really... Compared to what Reynard is doing, I can't even, like, get that worried about it. It, it would suck. Yes, it would suck. But, like, Reynard is a fucking genuine out here serial killer. Rapist. Psychopath. You know, like... He just feels a lot more real and close to home to me. There are men like this out there who just do this for fun. Like this is a genuine real thing versus a kind of like other world monster that's trying to drain magic from the world. Ah, it's hard for me to like feel viscerally about him the way I feel about Reynard. Um, and really what kills me isn't them swooping in and taking the beast out of the picture it's that Julia walks in and stares at Reynard and takes her fucking time about this. And I know again that it is meant to be this way for the plot of the thing to work out. I'm not even like angry at Julia. I'm angry at the writers for this, but she really fucking is in that room and is staring down at this dude whom she claimed she wanted dead, whom all of this is down to, with a girl next to her who's missing fingers, who sacrificed for her. 
And she is taking so long. Yeah, okay, so you have the beast with you that can can freeze a god. Nevertheless, it's still a god. Get it done, you fuck. But does she? No. She continues standing until the beast actually says to her, by the way, I am not completely like unchallenged here. He's fighting what I'm doing to him. So maybe you should fucking do this again. Just do it. What are you waiting for? They're all positioned. They've moved even the chair out of the way that Marina was sitting in. How is that the priority here? Fucking kill him. You Jags. Jesus Christ. So, yeah. And Marina literally says, Jesus Christ, Julia, would you please just gut this guy? Finally, again, Julia is just like taking too damn long. And she grabs the knife out. She looks up and rather than like running forward and stabbing Reynard and getting that done, she runs at Penny to stop him from trying to grab the beast. If you fucking stabbed Reynard, they could take the beast and you'd be done and it would be fine. What is wrong with you? The beast has done his job. The guy is frozen. It takes two steps for you to get to this guy and shove this and and it, what are you doing julia where is marina she should have had the the knife this would have been done marina would be fucking alive and the beast would be dead because they had done this properly and we hadn't wouldn't have julia in that circle and reynard would be dead because marina would have killed him and everything would have worked out and everybody could have gotten what they wanted but no that is not what happened because the writers just want to make Julia an asshole is really what it feels like. Honestly, it feels like they have like a vendetta against her a little bit. So the fucking beast wakes up out of his stupor, the knife, which Julia let go of, by the way, in her efforts to stop Penny, because again, that was the fucking priority in that moment. The knife is on the floor between them. They both lunge forward. And when she comes back later, Marina is dead and her heart is gone. And Julia, you are an idiot. I'm sorry, but you are. The writers made you an idiot. It's not your fault. It's what's been done to you. It's not fair. It's not right. But there it is. Meanwhile, she tags along into the fucking, like, quadrangle or whatever you want to call it, where the spell is going off, and stands in front of the beast as they're about to set off this god-killing fucking spell. And they can't focus because Quentin is too distracted at the fact that they could kill Julia and jumps forward and kind of ruins the thing, and the hit that Alice gets against the beast misses and it's like sears off part of his skin, but it does not hit him a direct hit that kills him. And again, Julia, I'm sorry, but this group of people, they're never going to forgive you for this at this point. It, what you had done already was bad enough. This and it ends up in the death of Alice. I don't think this is ever going to be made up for. And I have to imagine that anywhere there was talk about the show, whether this was Twitter, Facebook, in the comment sections of reviews, whatever, Reddit, it has to be just all shit talking of Julia pretty much, right? I figure that's what's happening. I just assume. And I like the thing is that nobody's wrong. That's what sucks. They're not wrong. I just want these writers to make the co the characters make better choices pretty much from beginning to end of this episode. Um, and she gets transported back into our world by Penny. And he is 
not even dropping her back into the apartment that he came from. So I'm not sure if that's just because his like, you know, his casting hands are fucked up. And so he can't control well enough. And he just he can get back into our world, but he can't necessarily like pick where he's landing the same way. Um, But whatever the case, he doesn't bring her back to where she wants to go. She is demanding that like he bring him back into Fillory so that she can get the beast and come back here. And he does not, of course, want to cooperate when she's grabbing at him, trying to insist. One of his bracelets gets ripped off and his hand starts to flip out and she realizes what's happening and grabs the other one and rips that bracelet off. And he begins to glitch in and out of existence. And it is very like upsetting, honestly, like this does seem like a huge fucking drag and i mean i get (laughs) guys have you ever had your headphones on and you're listening to a really good song that you like or a podcast that's super interesting and the cord of your headphones gets caught and gets yanked out and you just feel this rage that comes out of seemingly nowhere and suddenly you just want to like take your headphones and break them in half. That's kind of what I picture happening to Penny when he glitches like this, except over and over and over again. It's like a constant series of, of interruptions that like, he's just sort of feeling like he's settled and then it gets torn away from him again. Like that's it's, I, I don't know why that's my like point of reference for this, but that's how I feel. This is for him. Um, so they have to track down the beast who wound up getting away here and they figure because he's super injured that he probably went to the wellspring in order to top himself back up again, which is precisely where he went. But when he gets there, guess who's there first? The god Umber, I believe is his name, right? And Umber has predicted uh, I I don't even know if predict like I guess he just never it never occurred to him to do this and I don't know if it's because he knew that befouling the wellspring would fuck Fillory up and he didn't want to like risk doing that and now he figures Fillory's fucked already I may as well ruin things for this guy I I kind of feel like that's probably where he is but for whatever reason I, this one is Ember. Thank you, Hugabug. Um, whatever reason, he has decided that now is the perfect time to, quote, befoul the wellspring. And I love this. I love the way he keeps taunting the beast about it. The way he keeps making poop jokes. The, like, honestly, it's so immature and stupid. And it's exactly what I want for somebody to be going up against the beast who is in a suit and pretending to be really like civilized in his way or somehow, especially with Julia, he tries to sort of present the fact that he has detached himself from his emotions as being a, an advantage as being sort of him elevated beyond what she understands. And so going up against this guy who's literally using shit as a weapon is amazing. So, he can't top himself up at the wellspring and Alice has decided pretty much that she is going to go up against this motherfucker with everything that she's got left. And it's a pretty awesome battle, honestly. Like she's just like pushing him back and sending like jolts at him and, and he is trying to fight her and she is blocking him And she really manages to get him in a good spot. And then she starts to use the spell that she supposed to be like a god to handle. But it's clear that her godhood is gone because the bracelet burns the fuck out of her. So she rips it off 
and she keeps up with the spell anyway and tells Quentin not to worry and that she's got this. And she's got some pretty intense eye makeup on at this point, actually. And I wanted to I really like the way they did her eyes up here. I do miss her glasses because I feel like that was the thing I would have liked to see her goofy and in glasses doing this spell, to be honest. But I kind of understand why they wanted her eyes to be more visible. Um, and she begins to go up in blue flames like a niffin and is screaming. And it seems pretty clear this is over and the beast has won. And he's coming towards Quentin and he's laughing and he's really excited because he gets to kill this kid now for some reason that he's so focused on. And all of a sudden you see a hand on his shoulder and she says, I did it on purpose. And there she is. She has this like fucking chapped thing going on with the f the flakes of her skin like clearing and there's like blue fire underneath her skin. So it's clear that she is not like okay. <laughs> but she is in control for the moment and she is pretty badass and she touches his lips and he kind of seems to choke and she pushes him back and pulls open his jacket and all of these moths come pouring out, which is just a horror show to me. And he falls to the ground and one last blue moth climbs out of his mouth and she says, disappointing and then turns and walks towards Quentin and starts to, and she says your turn and opens her palm and it looks like she is going to burn him the fuck up and her friends have to go after her and stop her and I'm kind of hurrying through this because I'm over time but it ends with her screaming and we see her body on the ground and Quentin is trying to say maybe she's still alive. And Elliot knows very well that she is not. And is like, you need to let go, dude. Like, I'm sorry, but you gotta, you have to let go. And as they are seeing this, Julia is coming back to uh, Marina's apartment and finding her body. Um, you know, I'm looking at her and I'm actually not sure that her heart was ripped out. I think she might just have been like had her throat cut. Um, but yeah, two really cool women who appear to be dead and I'm bummed about it. And I hope that that's not what happened. But if Alice sacrificed herself in that way to save everybody, that feels very in character. And I'm not mad at her. I'm mad more about Marina, to be honest. Um, but yeah, so oof, so a lot happens. That's what I'm saying. I hope you guys enjoyed me talking about how much happens and how angry I am. And Julia, girl, I've like been on your side so many times and I feel like we're at the end of the road. The end of the road. So yeah, I'm sad. Um, all right, guys. Well, I'm going to go. Thank you again, Nicole, so much for commissioning this. Thank you to everybody in the chat for hanging out with me, talking to me about this. And I'm really interested to see what we get next episode. So until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.